Mark got started in, in geology at uh, uh, the College. I'm sure you almost cut it off. And following that, uh, got Fulbright funding to go to New Zealand, uh, and that visit extended into a master's thesis that was co-advised by our own Stuart Simmons when he was at the University of Auckland. Uh, he returned then to the USA and entered the PhD program at uh, what one of my fellow grad students once referred to as a small technical institute in New England that you probably never heard of. And that would be the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, um, where Mark worked with Sam Bowery developing techniques uh, of uranium lead dating and applying them to a diverse range of geologic problems, which is a fairly good summary of what he's been doing ever since as well. So he finished at MIT in 2002, spent a few years at uh, Carnegie's Depart uh, Department of Terrestrial Magnetism doing things that had nothing to do with terrestrial magnetism. Uh, and then another MIT alum, uh, C.J. Northrup, uh, talked him into moving to the state of the uh, So at Boise, he set up a state-of-the-art uranium lead lab with both uh, ID TIMS and LAICP MS capability. Uh, and is applying those methods to everything from evolution of the Earth's crust and lithosphere to the temporal patterns of extinctions and climate change. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mark to tell us about it. Thanks very much, John. Uh, thank you all for, um, for hosting me. I look forward to talking with Mark and I really enjoyed the conversations I've had today. Um, I have a pretty ambitious agenda here uh, in trying to get through uh, what I what I title my talk as, as, as New Developments in Geochronology. Now, new is a relative term. Uh, I'm going to show you data that's been collected uh, over the probably past five or six years. And, and, uh, but, but I do want to um, bring a few different messages of how, as geochronologists, we have an exciting opportunity to take time and all the things that go with it and understand our systems in, in, a, in a really remarkable way. Um, so you'll see these images as, as I move through, and, and they, um, they do bear upon some of the main themes of, of how we integrate geochronology with lots of different types of data to study our systems. Uh, and uh, without further ado, I do want to um, make some acknowledgments. Um, uh, in terms of uh, the capabilities that we've been able to develop at Boise State through NSF's generosity. Uh, networks and communities of, of, of scientists that have really been influential for me uh, and for uh, the, the trajectory of geochronology in general, uh, the Earth Rates Research Coordination Network uh, more recently, and then for over 15 years now, the Earth Time community of scientists. Um, Tiffany Rivera is in the room, in the front, and, I, and I thank Tiffany for, for um, for, uh, or give her credit for uh, some of the data I'll present today, uh, a little bit later. Um, and then a few um, scientists that have, uh, I've been working with uh, taking geochronology into the stratigraphic record. Um, I have to, um, to, to dedicate this uh, presentation to Dr. Sam Bowery. Uh, John mentioned that, that Sam was my PhD advisor, and Sam uh, was a, a profoundly influential scientist uh, in terms of the development of geochronology and its application at really um, unprecedented uh, levels of, of detail, precision, uh, and uh, he uh, unfortunately passed away uh, about six months ago. We lost him in uh, July of 2019, and uh, you know, his, uh, one of his mantras was, no dates, no rates, uh, and as you'll see, I've taken that up as one of my memes and, and tried to move it forward as best I can. So my roadmap today is, is, first of all, telling time with accuracy and precision. You can do both of those things. And then I'm going to introduce you to um, the petrochronology workflow, as I call it. Uh, actually, a workflow that many people in this room are uh, pursuing. That's, a, that's an exciting uh, evolution of geochronology. Um, I'm going to give you a couple case studies, one in uh, high temperature geochemistry and, and magmatic processes, and then one in the stratigraphic realm and paleobiology. biology. And then I'm going to close with what I think is one of the more exciting ways to move forward in, in, in telling time uh, and, and understanding this record, and that is integrating data within a Bayesian framework. 
So, science of geochronology. As a geochronologist, when people ask me why, why do I do this, I say because I can interrogate questions in correlation, in causality, and in the rates of geologic processes. That gives me so many opportunities to interact with, with people like yourself in the audience and, and across different disciplines in, our, in their sciences. When I do that, I ask a couple of very simple questions. How old? Why do I ask that question? Well, as I said, correlation and causality. We can address hypotheses about, for example, why mass extinctions occur by looking at uh, the um, correlation and uh, sequencing of other uh, dramatic events in our systems like low-light impacts of thunderstorms. I can also ask how fast, right? And I do that because I'm interested in rates. Rates of geologic processes from the modern to the Median. A few examples of, of, examples of rates that, that I am interested in. Now, when I ask those two questions, how old and how fast, the subtext is I'm also asking how accurate is my geochronology? How accurate are those inferences or hypothesis tests of causality? And in terms of how fast, I, I really want to know how precise. What are my true constraints on rate? We use a variety of techniques now to, to, to do geochronology, and I, I'm going to focus on uranium lead geochronology today, particularly focus on the mineral zircon uh, as the, the premier chronometer that, that I've uh, spent the most time uh, thinking and worrying about. We can apply in situ techniques like eye microprobe and lo, uh, laser ablation, ICPMS. These have wonderful spatial resolution, and um, here's a zircon in the background on the present got the talk. Uh, here's a laser ablation pit within a zircon that's a few hundred microns in long dimension. So we have wonderful spatial resolution to interrogate the age of that zone with the in-situ technique. Now the trade-off is that we don't have many ions and uh, there are aspects of the technology that, that give us analytical uncertainties and so we're limited to about the percent level of temporal resolution with an in-situ technique. High spatial, relatively low temporal resolution. Of course, it depends on the question that you're asking. So for a 100 million year old uh, granitoid, let's say we can uh, use an in-situ technique, uh, we can get resolutions of perhaps a million years uh, we work hard at. We also have in our toolkit isotope dilution, right? the gold standard for <coughs> precise and accurate measurements of isotope ratios. Isotope dilution suffers in the spatial resolution camp. Um, it's been fairly typical to be able to take this whole crystal right, and dissolve it and measure it by isotope dilution. Um, what do we gain when we do that? Well, we gain temporal resolution. We can measure the isotope ratios and interpret the age of that crystal um, at the, down to a, a level of maybe 20 to 50 times more precision and we can talk about accuracy uh, in a moment. But that gives us the opportunity for a 100 million year old granite to start to interrogate time scales of tens of thousands of years. Who needs all that precision anyway? Okay, that's a question that many people ask me. Um, I, would, I would return the question, what are the rates of change in your system? That should be driving your quest for precision. How long do transitions in your system last? Right? How much resolution do you need to get at that rate? And I would argue that lots of very interesting rates and processes are operative at the time scales of thousands to tens of thousands of years. So that is what drives me to try and apply higher and higher precision and accuracy to your chronology, deeper and deeper in time to try and access those sorts of time scales. How do we tell time in rocks? Um, we have a, a geologic uh, stratigraphic sequence here. This is the Primor Triassic boundary uh, strata at Meishan in China. Uh, within that rock sequence, within the rock record, we have events, biological events, like mass extinctions. <coughs> we have physical events, like the deposition of volcanic tephra, and we have 
interpretations that we've placed upon the rock record in terms of, for example, boundaries, or, uh, golden spikes that, that provide our definition of time uh, within these rock sequences. Okay. Environment that uh, gives us more confidence about the, uh, the assumptions that we're making in terms of, is this zircon dating the process I'm interested in? So texture, again, here are cathodal luminescence images. So we can see the texture of those inter internally within crystals. Um, we, could, uh, we could make those same images within a thin section, right, and provide the petrographic context of, of those crystals. Petrochronology is also about interrogating the geochemical context. So we can put in situ spot analyses on those crystals and, and measure things like their um, rare earth element chemistry or their uh, titanium contents, which is a proxy for the temperature. Um, that information should inform <coughs> our sampling then for isotope ratios. How do we do the sampling? Well, we've um, been doing things like using our laser to cut up the crystals. Now, I admit to a little bit of hubris here. I, I did sit down one morning and think, could I cut up a zircon like a loaf of bread? <laughs> and at the end of the day, I did it. Um, yeah, you know, it's not the best way to sample that zircon from a science perspective, but it looks cool. So. <laughs> There's a laser pit right there. I think it's this crystal, actually. Um, yeah, so that's, that's fun. <laughs> uh, here's a titanite crystal, here's a laser pit within it. Uh, in this case, I actually doubly polished the crystal so I can characterize both sides and be really confident of the volume that I'm going to then dissolve for high, high precision ratio measurements. Okay. So these are the sort of the fun things we do in the lab to, um, to try and refine our ability to uh, spatially resolve our high precision temporal analysis to bring in situ and isotope pollution together as best we can. Um, a few pictures of the lab. Uh, we use a variety of in situ LAIC PMS and isotope dilution um, uh, thermalization mass spectrometers. We do a lot of development in the laboratory, in the clean lab, and in the laser lab. Again, in the surface of trying to bring these generally separate endeavors together in the same laboratory. All right, so what do we do with that? We have a petrochronology workflow that we can apply to a variety of problems. Case study number one, let's look at uh, rhyolites and super eruptions. Uh, to lay the background um, for the, some of the motivating ideas and hypotheses, um, in terms of the origins of crystal core rhyolites, uh, that, um, like those that have, uh, have erupted, for example, at Yellowstone, that we'll look at some examples of. Uh, we have uh, this. Um, this paper by uh, Olivier Bachman and Jorik Bergans in 2004 has been a real touchstone for, uh, for discussions about the origins of crystal core rhyolites, the idea of extraction of, of liquids from long-lived crystal mushes. The idea that crystal mushes are really how these magmas reside uh, in the crust for significant periods of time. Um, extracting a liquid an eruptable magma, a, a crystal core rhyolite from a crystal mush, mush takes time. And, and uh, Olivier and George's numerical experiments uh, um, uh, would suggest that the operative time scales are on the order of a uh, sort of 100,000 years, a few hundred thousand years to extract super eruptive volumes of, of crystal core liquid from the crystal mush. Now, at the time that, that those experiments were being done numerically, we had a, a variety of, of measurements being done on zircons, some of the pioneering work using the ion microprobe to measure uh, the ages of Pleistocene zircons using uranium light geochronology. Um, this is an example from the Bishop Tuff, and these data sets were being generated in the late 90s and early 2000s, and they seem to, to affirm this sort of idea of hundreds of thousands of years of, of record of crystallization in these uh, large volume tufts. You can see here on the on the x-axis here, we have uh, analyses of the age of zircons from the Bishop Tuff, which span several hundred thousand years. <coughs> a 
Another question here, are super erupted volumes derived from low magma flux integrated over long times? Okay, so again, if we have hundreds of thousands of years to gradually accumulate those magmas and, and express that liquid out, then perhaps recurrence interval is a proxy for the amount of time it takes to generate these sorts of magmas. This is not a new idea. It, it uh, derives from some wonderful compilations of, uh, like the one uh, reproduced in, in Justin Simon's uh, paper on repose interval versus volume. Um, and this is a quote from, from Justin's paper. The contrasting view, or the, the, the other end of the spectrum, would be that instead, our super eruptive volume is a hallmark of anomalously high magma fluxes. Not business as usual, but punctuated events in productivity of these systems. And a, a very nice review paper in Elements a few years back by um, Ryan Frazier, Tim Colin, and, uh, 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 and Ryan Mills. Uh, suggested here from a compilation that, uh, in fact, yes, ignimbrites from a uh, flux volume perspective just look different than the plutonic business as usual.
How would we do that? How would we have these high flux events? How would we create lots of rhyolite really quickly? Uh, work by um, Simikin and, and, and Bindemann uh, from a, a numerical modeling perspective as well as uh, careful uh, uh, tracer work uh, looking at uh, in particular oxygen isotopes uh, have been very um, very influential in developing a, a contrasting uh, view that uh, <coughs> remelting of early form uh, caldera um, materials uh, can in fact give you very large volumes of rhyolites on very short time scales as long as you have a heat source, right? some sort of, for example, mantle drive flux uh, into the system. skip over this, it's just a, another wrinkle in the, um, in the rapid uh, remounting or, or rapid um, tempo idea. But basically I want to ask the question, can we look at zircons, can we use this petrochemologic toolkit to say something about these contrasting models of how we create pilots? All right, so I want to give you a couple of examples that not too far from home here, just in, in your backyard and mine, uh, from the Yellowstone Caldera. And uh, this is work motivated, again, by Tiffany Rivera uh, as an outgrowth of her, uh, her PhD work uh, uh, at the University of, of Roskilde, uh, working with Michael Story. Uh, she tapped into the power of uh, integrating uh, chronometers, integrating carbon 4039 and uranium lead. Uh, as well as astrochronology as, as an independent uh, timekeeper. Uh, and so uh, when she was uh, a postdoc with, with me at Boise State, she really um, set the standard for how we look at these types of systems. Uh, zircon petrochronology perspective. Here's a bunch of beautiful zircons from the Huckleberry Rooftop, right, Yellowstone's first super -nurture. This is work published in Geology uh, a few years back. Here is the chemical side of petrochronology. So each of those zircons analyzed uh, by laser ablation. In addition to age, we get the chemistry. I mentioned we can look at uh, rare earth elements and the slope of rare earth element patterns. We can look at um, temperature directly from the titanium content. Europium anomaly, right? Uh, that is a uh, function of the, or proxy for crystallinity in a magmatic system if that uh, anomaly grows in as you crystallize feldspar. Okay. So we see beautiful correlated arrays in, in many of these uh, chemical parameters extracted from zircon. For example, we see um, a range of temperatures of zircon crystallization from about 900 degrees Celsius, not a bad number in terms of the saturation of zirconium in the silicic high silica rhyolite. Uh, all the way down to uh, temperatures of about 700 degrees, or just under. Not a bad estimator of the solidus for, uh, for rhyolites. Um, those temperatures are correlated with um, this estimate of crystallinity. Okay? And we can um, complement that with, with how the incompatible trace elements also increase down temperature uh, during cooling, again through the progressive crystallization and differentiation of the magnets. So this is all giving us a picture of how the magma system is evolving prior to eruption. And we should be able to take this framework and apply time to extract the rates and durations. So when we do that, um, we have to have a backstop of, of when did the, the rhyolite erupt. That comes from argon 4039, insanity. Okay, so, um, an estimate um, uh, based on the, the um, dominant youngest mode of, of sanding crystals in the Huckleberry Ridge Top gives you uh, this estimate for the eruption age. And then when we look at here, the ages of zircons that we extract after that in situ analysis and do high precision isotope dilution work on, we see that there is a range of ages. But interestingly, that whole temperature range from zirconium saturation all the way down to near solidus conditions is recorded in this youngest mode of the admittedly complex PDF. Suggesting that that whole record of differentiation is captured in that mode and we can compare that then to the eruption age and that's what we're doing here. 
So the youngest mode of zircon, which incorporates that whole differentiation series, compared to the Sanidine age, has a differential of just 11,000 years. Now, there are older crystals in the mix, and we'll continue to explore that in other samples of where those crystals come from, but, but I'll just throw out um, the, the interpretation that those are crystals that have been recycled, uh, taken up uh, from earlier magmatic products of the system, and incorporated into the, um, the top, um, either just prior to or during the eruption. Well, if you don't believe me about that case, um, we can just work our way down the Yellowstone system. Here's the Mesa Falls stuff, and the next super eruption out of, of, of Yellowstone. The same uh, workflow, um, lots of crystals, lots of in situ analysis, exploring the chemistry, um, which we see here, modeling it uh, in, a, in a quantitative way. And this is from uh, uh, Rivera et al's uh, Journal of Petrology article in 2016. Um, we have a dramatic um, uh, range in aerobium anomaly and incompatible trace elements like niobium and uranium. Uh, correlated uh, trends which we can model uh, again with fractional crystallization as differentiation um, of the magma body from uh, sort of eruptible volumes down to very near the solids. In fact, we, we estimate for some of these uh, very high uranium cores of zircons that the crystallinity must have approached 90, 95, even 100 percent. Well, what does this mean? One interesting thing ab about these um, really dark high uranium cores in the zircons is that we can date those very precisely. And they're insensitive to uh, the little the rims around them. We can model those away too if we want. Um, the high uranium cores, it's a basic superposition constraint. The magmatic event, which gives us these rims and the majority of the crystal volume uh, of zircon in the basic ball stuff. Um, right, the cores have to be older than the rims. Okay, so these cores, right, which are shown here in the gray, provide a firm constraint on the maximum age of the Mesa Falls magma system. Turns out most of the analyses of all the zircons do fall in this mode, uh, and so we can combine those constraints together to document that, again, most of the crystal volume had to, um, or the magma volume of the Mesa Falls Tough uh, system had to accumulate um, over no more than time scales of 20,000 years. And when we combine the sanidine and zircon together, again, we get this differential in terms of differentiation of the magma system to eruption of, in this case, just a few thousand. So we're getting a s consistent signal from these high volume, high cycle relics. So where do we go from this? I think this is pointing us in this direction of anomalously high rates of magma production associated with these super eruptions. Plutonic sort of systems are different. And I think the difference um, is, is really uh, established uh, in, this, in this diagram, in this review, uh, with this idea that plutonic rocks are, uh, are recording systems that have lower magma flux than these high, um, these high silica rhyolites that, that result in super -rocks. So which do I prefer here? Obviously, you know, the truth is, is somewhere on the spectrum, but um, at least from the work that we've done, uh, expressing the melts for mushes seems too slow, at least for, for these large volumes of magma. And that um, it's pushing us toward these models of remelting uh, due to uh, episodes of, of high flux from the of basalt from the mantle, underplating and, and uh, driving crustal melting. Okay, deep breath. <coughs> now for something very different. We're going to go from the high, uh, uh, high temperature realm into um, earlier biology. And a very different look at how time 
uh, informs rates and um, causality uh, in the biosphere. I chose the Cambrian for my example. Um, I've been working with um, some colleagues looking at the origins of uh, biomineralization and the origins of trilobites as, as a key um, uh, biota uh, associated with um, the early and middle Cambrian. Uh, the Cambrian, the pre-Cambrian transition is well known as a, as a dramatic change in the biosphere, an increase in diversity and disparity body plan, um, uh, as well as the disappearance of our earlier Eacher and Fulminates. So what's going on in the Cambrian system? I pull out this quote from Charles Marshall's annual reviews uh, paper in 2006 on explaining the Cambrian explosion of animals. And I want you to read this. Cambrian explosion is a unique episode in Earth history where essentially all the animal phyla first appear in the fossil record. The time of onset is constrained by the evolution of the environment, whereas its duration appears to be controlled primarily by rates of developmental innovation. Now when I see this kind of statement as a geochronologist, when I see time of onset and duration, I see something that I can contribute. Now, yeah, I mean, in broad brush, I think um, Marshall probably has the answers here, but there's so much we can do if we can constrain these durations and constrain this timing uh, with respect to other changes in the Earth system. So let's go to Morocco. Uh, this is the, um, the Anti-Atlas and uh, the, the western margin of Gondwana uh, in the Cambrian, and these are beautiful um, pair sequences, carbonate uh, rich sequences of um, middle Cambrian age, um, beautiful cyclicity, and uh, we have the opportunity um, to look at some of the earliest records of trilobite origination. Uh, this is the section. Uh, here are some of the, the earliest um, identifiable, identifiable trilobite uh, faunas, and uh, within the section they are dispersed over many tens of meters of, of these uh, carbonate pair sequences. When did trilobites originate? Uh, there, you can create a Wheeler diagram like this and, and try and line out uh, with some sort of correlation across different continents, paleocontinents, when trilobites first appear in the record. And you look at this and you might say, well, yeah, it looks, looks like we have some pretty good understanding of, of where they appear on different uh, comments and maybe there's some lag with certain um, settings. Is that uh, controlled by taphonomy? Is it controlled by environment? Those are great questions. Is it controlled by real changes in origination? Um, but I get troubled, right, when I see a, a wheel diagram with no time, although no numerical time on the y-axis here. Um, how do we really know? correlations. Again, that's something that we can contribute to with the geochronology. Here is uh, an example of a discrete volcanic ash bed uh, within the T-out section. Uh, so this is a great, uh, the best thing that we could have in terms of trying to tell time in that sequence. The, you know, geologically, this is a, essentially an instantaneous event. We actually have three of these event beds that I'll show you data for through the sequence. I, I highlight those in different colors. Uh, and they bracket this, uh, the first fragments of trilobites and the first uh, identifiable, identifiable fi uh, uh, genera and species. So it's a good first um, starting point for constraining the age. Um, here are those ash beds. In this case, every swath is a different sample. And uh, these are great guides to um, a first look at, at the populations and how homogeneous they are or not. Uh, and then we can again do chemistry. Here are the laser pits on uh, these crystals to um, try and understand what these differences in capital luminescence response might mean. Um, here are a set of, of geochemical plots just to show you that um, different ash beds have different ranges of composition and we can use these geochemical parameters to identify that these are discrete um, 
volcanic events, and they're not just reworking of the same <coughs> material through through the sequence. Um, in fact, it's kind of cool, right? These so this is the youngest, and this is the oldest, and you see that some of the youngest samples have uh, some grains in that that look just like the ash bed below it. So yes, there is some reworking. So inheritance of of crystals into later eruptions. We're not surprised by that. Um, but we use the pepper technology to screen them out. So when we do that, we get very precise ages. The only thing I want you to, to um, take away from these Concordia diagrams, the traditional way that we show uh, granium lead zircon ages um, and measurements, is that we can achieve right, reproducibility from crystal to crystal to crystal. Uh, what look like normally distributed populations, which we can describe with a fairly simple model, a weighted mean algorithm, to get um, resolutions of um, approaching 100,000 years for the Cambrian. So we have a lot of signal and um, bandwidth to try to test these ideas of biological evolution, which are happening at the millennial um, and to tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of years. And we can do this now um, fairly routinely with the ash beds. Now that's not all we have in the system. We have lots of um, event beds that look suspiciously like ash beds. And hopeful paleontologists collect them and send them to the lab. And what we find are um, Unfortunately, a lot of these things are simply polyclastic. Um, maybe there's a little bit of ash in there, but they're clearly reworked detrital um, sedimentary rocks. They're not event beds. So um, for decades, what did we do with that data? Um, you know, we, we plot it and we threw it away. Who cares? It's not a volcanic ash bed. It's not worth anything. Well, that's not true. Every sample has some value. In this case, we have um, uh, on a probability density plot of age uh, versus um, well, relative probability. We clearly have a peak, which is Cambrian in age. There are Cambrian zircons in the sample, but they're accompanied by lots of other stuff. Okay? So I can't uh, interpret this as an event then. I'm not comfortable with <coughs> that. But maybe the youngest zircons provide a robust maximum depositional age that we can use if we can understand how to take that data and integrate it with our other information, with our ash beds, with our biosphere. That's a challenge. How do we take disparate data and put it together in a single statistical frame? Well, that's the last part of my talk. Bayesian age model. Embracing Bayes' rule and having it change your life. <laughs> this is what I've been going through over the last few years. And it's exciting uh, to me that really no other thing in geochronology, because there's so many applications of the Bayesian inference to geochronology. Well, what is this? OK, a little uh, audience participation. So. Turn to your neighbor, and I'd like you to try and come up with an answer to this question. How do you combine data into models? And I want you to talk to your neighbor about that for like 30 seconds about these three different columns of data. So just looking at this column of information, data, how would you combine it into a model? Looking at these things, how would you combine those distributions? And then finally, over at the end. Okay, 30 seconds, turn to your neighbor, talk about something. So, any volunteers from the audience for this column here? What, when presented with this, what would you do with it? Anyone? Take the median. Take the median, okay. Okay, any other someone else? Could be some sort of parametric expectation value, right? Yeah. So you might take the sum or the medium or the mode or yeah. We have models for how to handle numbers. Okay. 
How about the, the middle column? Anybody? How do you take those distributions and combine them? Yeah. Oh, that wasn't a hand. <laughs> <laughs> area and a curve. Okay. All right. So if you take the area under each of these curves, um, is there something about the shape of that distribution that looks familiar? Yeah, they look like bell-shaped curves. Maybe they're Gaussian or normal distributions. Well, again, we have some parametric techniques for, for how we can evolve those together. So for example, we can take the inverse variance weighted mean. Uh, to try and understand what the mean value of these three very different distributions might be. All right, well, how about the last, last column? No idea? Well, this is, this is my point, Bayes' rule. Bayes' rule gives us the tool, the, the, the firm statistical basis to take these very different probability density functions <coughs> and convolve them into a single model of probability. Now, I, I put some labels on those. You know, we, we probably describe those uh, volcanic ash bed ages with a, with a Gaussian distribution. Okay, we might um, describe a maximum depositional age as, as, a, as a, a uniform distribution between the youngest zircon and some, some bound on how young the sample could be. And we don't really know anything else. All right, so we'll just decide that sort of a boxcar distribution. And then um, that could also be a magneto prong, right, for example. And then down at the bottom, sedimentation, sedimentation rate. Maybe we have some um, understanding of, of the, from the depositional environment, how rapidly rock accumulates. Not a number, but a distribution. This is a gamma distribution. Right, so we have a likely value and then this long tail to potentially uh, more um, sort of fast versus slow deposition rates. All right, this is a problem that the radiocarbon community tackled decades ago. Uh, in lacustrine sequences, under very fairly restricted um, uh, sedimentary and temporal environments. So um, Bayesian age modeling incorporates a bunch of different constraints on the problem. Some things that we call prior information, for example, like uh, those accumulation rates. And then we condition those, that prior information by data. In this case, these are radiocarbon <coughs> dated horizons within the lake sequence. All right, so Bayes rule is formulated this way. It's all about conditional probabilities. We take our prior probability, this might again be something about sedimentation rate, it might be that Gaussian, sort of that gamma distribution, but it also be simply the fact that we know the rocks on the bottom are older than the rocks on the top, superposition. We can code that in today's rule as a prior probability. Then we, we take that prior, we condition it with data, right? Data. Um, conditional on the parameters of the model. We multiply those probabilities together, normalize them, and we get what we call the posterior, the output model. Our new estimate of the parameters right, as a function of that data. That's just the general formulation of Bayes' rule. The labels there are, are meant to give you a sense for, for what those probabilities are. Uh, entail in the age model. We have sedimentation rate and superposition in the prior. We have uh, ages or reversals or cyclicity in the likelihoods. And together, um, they are convolved into our age model. Um, visually, this is, this is kind of what it looks like. So um, each one of these lines is a path through our stratigraphic sequence. And that path, in this case, is a bunch of piecewise linear um, chords that um, go through all of the uh, conditioning ages that's shown by the bars. And they have a superposition. You notice that none of these, uh, they're all monotonic. None of them go back in time. That's good. Mm -hmm. So the model is obeying superposition. 
And you notice that right, some of the segments um, have very um, slow accumulation rates. Other segments have very rapid accumulation rates. We're capturing that probability function uh, that we have input for segmentation. What we get out of this is that a model, continuous model through the sequence with uncertainties throughout. And arguably robust uncertainties. Um, so as I said, the radiocarbon community did this decades ago. Um, what we have recently done uh, with uh, uh, Robin Trailer, who's now a postdoc at, at UC Merced, um, we took the, the algorithms underlying one of these Bayesian age models, and we have loosened them up uh, in some ways and tightened them in others to make them accessible to deep time. So now we can, we can run these um, regardless of depositional system, regardless of, of absolute time, regardless of the duration of the, the sequence. Okay. It's an R package. Uh, it's uh, uh, open source, widely available. Um, and uh, incorporates some great tools to allow you to assess the um, functionality, uh, assess the um, how well the, uh, the underlying Markov chain uh, computational engine is uh, approaching your posterior distribution. All right, let me show you a, a, a quick animation which um, <coughs> tries to do this through our data from, again, that T out section. It incorporates three ash bed ages, the Gaussian distributions. It incorporates this funny distribution here. Okay, this is uh, my estimate of a uh, a probability distribution for the detrital zircon constraint. Okay, the youngest age is right here, plus or minus our, my normal distribution. The, this horizon can't be any older than the dated ash bed above it. Okay, so this is that constraint. And then it's just a uniform probability between. And you can build any probability you want um, within, this, within this code. Uh, you see a few lines. Here, they're very uh, faint, sorry. Um, so those are just the first few models that are running in a Gibbs sampler through, um, through that sequence. All right, so there I'm building an ensemble of, 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 of models. Uh, just loop back through again there. Um, and so we're um, applying a, a Monte Carlo technique here to try and recover that posterior distribution. And that gives us a high density interval uh, associated with, uh, you know, with all of those models together. Uh, we're going to generally run this you know, 10,000 times, 20,000 times to, to achieve uh, that estimate of the posterior. All right, so what does it do? It gives us a continuous age model okay, with an uncertainty band, okay, which uh, incorporates the prior information as well as our data horizons. Um, I want to point out here, um, our first trilobite fragments are at this horizon. Our first uh, uh, named species is right here. Okay? And so in red, this was our original error envelope. Not, not too good. Because okay? we didn't have any data right, where I wanted to constrain the trilobites. This is where that, that detrital zircon constraint comes in. You can see that that uncertainty, right, that, and that's the 95% highest density interval, simply by the incorporation of that youngest, um, the maximum depositional age constraint, the youngest zircons in that sandstone, dramatically improves the uncertainty on the age of that horizon. This, this is just the start, right? We need to be routinely searching for and incorporating these youngest depositional age constraints into any sort of age model like this to really knock down the uncertainties on our understanding of the continuous distribution of time through the sequences. All right, well, my original question of uh, when did trilobites first appear in the sequence, I have an answer to that now. 519.95 um, with an uncertainty 
that um, incorporates both stratigraphic uncertainty as well as the, the radioisotopic uncertainty. How does this compare with, with our other uh, cratons or, or our other continents? Um, we've got some constraints, mostly from carbonized structure degradation uh, of 521 to 523 MA. So we're starting to, I think, finally build an edifice of, of constraints now on, on when biomineralization and, and trilobites um, rapidly evolve and appear um, uh, across the Earth system. Okay. And it turns out, if you're curious, I'm not going to talk about it. I don't want to get in trouble, but this cyclicity looks really suspiciously like Milankovitch. And in fact, my age model does suggest that these pair sequences uh, are the feet of the precession cycle. Uh, from my age model, with uncertainties, um, if I just do cycle counting, those come up at 19,000. Intriguing needs to be affirmed by more statistically robust astrochronology, but I think it's a great starting point for um, another way to tell time. Okay, that is plenty. Here's my destination. Okay, this is what modern chronology does for us. We need to integrate it within all of the contextual information necessary to be confident about the age. Isotope ratios to dates only ages, petrochronology helps us arrive at that, that robust context. And then finally, again, I'm so excited about how we can no longer be snobs about our data. All data has use, as long as you can describe its probability. And, and Bayes is the way to go. Thank you. <laughs>